Hello, everyone, and well, welcome, Felix, back again. Uh, lovely to see you. And um, a very interesting to topic for discussion. Um, what is happening in Berlin as regards uh, property? And um, we have a social housing referendum going on at the moment in Berlin. I think it was, I think the results of it were due, um, I think the results of it were due in June. Um, but they're deciding uh, uh, on whether to uh, reappropriate uh, housing stock in Berlin uh, from private and corporate landlords. Uh, and along with that article, we also have um, another that I contributed on, which is uh, No City Hates Its Landlords Quite Like Berlin. <laughs> And we also had some very interesting links with, uh, uh, um, his name is obscured on my um, notes, Vulcan Zyman, and um, the other link to the, uh, which was the 23rd Berlin Real Estate Talk. Um, Felix, where do you want to start with this? Where, what, what would you like to kick off with? Okay, so I actually prepared a little presentation. Um, I watched the 23rd Berlin Real Estate Talk and um, <laughs> I see John smiling already. Uh, he, he must know my thoughts. Um, it was painful to watch. I watched it until the end. Um, but um, I think, interestingly, the presentation is going to actually address many of the things said um, in there. And um, I actually re-edited after watching that one again <laughs> a bit. Um, one, one thing I think that's uh, important to understand for all of us is that uh, I did collect signatures for the initiative to expropriate the landlords in Berlin. Um, but I am not an official uh, representative or anything. So I'm not fully aware of uh, the internal structures of the organization. I just know how the power ends up being devolved in the local neighborhoods and everything, and how I and other grassroots level activists fit into that structure. Um, so, so the other video that you sent along, uh, I forgot the name of the guy from TU Berlin. What was, what was his name again? Uh, who was it? Do you remember? Uh, you Zyman. The Z Zyman, which was most interesting and incredibly inspiring. Yeah, yeah um, I absolutely agree. So um, the referendum is due to take place on the 26th of September. Um, but we are, we just finished collecting the signatures for the referendum to be approved. So we were supposed to. It might be also worth mentioning that uh, the Tempelhof Aerodrome had a vote yeah. in Berlin quite a few years ago. And the people around the area of Tempelhof, which is a massive airport, uh, currently used for all sorts of social activities, nurseries, gardening, kite flying, cycling, you name it. Um, they had a survey and they were asked in the survey whether they wanted to see the area completely developed for housing, partially developed for housing, or to be left as it is. And my understanding was that the vote was to leave it as it is. Um, how long that will stand for, I don't know, but there is this incredible pressure in Berlin, as, as there is in pretty well, certainly in London, but a lot of major capital cities. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the uh, the Temple of Affair discussion is actually that connected to housing as well. I mean, I'm not going to mention it in the presentation I have prepared, but um, it, it's it, the, the question was, of course, whether or not private real estate developers will be allowed to develop property on 
well, the favorite park of all Berliners. It's not a park, it's a former airport, right? But it is a park now and the people rejected it, which leads, of course, to private landlords to argue there is too much red tape, neoliberalism. We need to cut red tape in order to develop um, properties in Berlin and solve the housing crisis. I will address it in the presentation. I just saw uh, no, no, these no. arguments about the red tape and neoliberalism I will address in the presentation. Um, I, I, I think I'll just try and share my screen. Yeah? Okay, so let's have your presentation. We're going to hit. Okay, we're off now. I, I, I live um, in uh, near Humanplatz, just north of Prenzlauerberg. So okay. neighbors just removed by time. All right, um, this is the uh, well, holding slide of my little um, uh, presentation, Expropriate Deutsche Wohnen, Fight Speculation, Expropriate Deutsche Wohnen. Um, that's the official name of uh, the uh, citizens movement in Berlin that's currently pushing to expropriate all private landlords with more than 3,000 flats, which in the end would affect about 240,000 flats. Uh, and their slogan is uh, fight speculation. I think it's one of the many slogans, but um, just just so everyone is, is on board with the branding, it will reappear. It's uh, in purple and yellow. And uh, here we have it again. That's me and my uh, younger brother, uh, my, my mirror image, people say, um, mm -hmm. after collecting um, signatures for, for several hours. In, in these little nice, highly visible vests, how we got these and um, a bit about like how that worked for us. I will, I will talk about in a, uh, in a bit. All right, um, just quick overview. Uh, what are we talking about? Who, who's involved? When is, has it happened? There already was some confusion, right? Like um, the referendum hasn't yet taken place, but there were various stages in the democratic process of how this referendum came about um, similar to what we talked about has happened in, uh, was it Sheffield, I believe, where citizens of course spotted a way to like democratically um, make their own decisions about their own space. Uh, and then out of that step-by-step -step, collecting signatures, getting through approval processes and everything, this movement evolved. Uh, why they did it, which um, is about rent increases, uh, tenant wars, um, whose streets as well. I will talk about like arguments and everything in, in, in that. Um, then, then how um, it came about, like or how it is imagined, like from the perspective of law. On the one hand, we have the referendum, which is of course concerning Berlin law, but on the other hand, there is a um, a section article 15 in the German basic law, the German constitution, right? Um, that allows for expropriation. And there is also a clear economic vision on uh, the, the price that expropriation should cost, but also um, the public agency that should manage the 240,000 Berlin properties that would be returned into the hands of the state. So, Yes, and what the grassroots have to do with it. I will also present some pro and uh, contra arguments. So I will have a slide with the most common contra arguments that at least I encountered while selecting uh, collecting signatures, how they like how 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 one can um, dismantle those pretty easily with simple statistics. Um, uh, then also what, what's really interesting, I think, for DiEM members, as far as I remember, DiEM. Um, always tries to look at um, a, like a holistic picture of an issue. We don't just talk about uh, about one aspect, right? We don't just see um, uh, we don't just see European disintegration and uh, think about okay, that's all to do with the European Central Bank. Yeah, there's like there's um, several several um, issues that you can think about. May it be the refugee crisis and everything. And that's also what this movement is doing. Everything that can be politically thought about may it be, um, may it be refugees, marginalized communities, domestic abuse and everything, those aspects also play into the housing crisis. So that's also something really important, I think, to touch on. And I would talk about um, the backlash, of course. Um, I think the first time I talked about it, must have been a month ago with John that was one of his um, burning questions how 
how um, landlords reacted to this initiative and uh, they surely did and we I, I don't know michael wasn't here yet i think um I'm not sure uh, who, who else, uh, not you, Michael, Sinclair, Michael, Alan. Uh, we, earlier we talked about fake news. We're going to be talking about fake news again. So <laughs> that's uh, gonna be a, a running theme. Now, why am I crazy about that? If you, if you remember, we had who, what, when, and I'm also gonna talk a bit about myself now. Michael might know this. I don't know um, when you moved to Berlin, um, but for me, I actually took three months to find a place and it consumed day and night. Uh, I, um, I, I tried finding a place. I reached out to 400 listings. Uh, I had an Excel spreadsheet like this where uh, everything was color coded. The links were in there, the next action points, what I had to do. Uh, uh, and it took literally forever. And in the end, I moved into an apartment that looked like this. Um, and I renovated it from the ground up with my lovely, lovely girlfriend who is just across the room right now. Uh, that's her walking through that mess. That's me doing the walls and that's pretty much how it looks today. I mean, obviously it's a bit more furniture in there now, but um, it actually has a, there, there is a political reason as to why we had to renovate that place. There was a rent cap. Some people might have heard about that in Berlin. So uh, the left wing government of Berlin decided to limit rents at six euros 50 per square meter starting in uh, February 2020. The Constitutional Court had just overruled that. But it was, in th it was that for a year. And in the summer of 2020, when I moved to Berlin, landlords started renting out apartments that hadn't been renovated or taken care of for as long as 50 years simply because they wouldn't see any profit in um, renovating those apartments if they couldn't charge high enough rents, right? So we said, all right, then if you don't want to renovate it, the rent has to be low. The rent is really low and low. We only pay four euros 50 per square meters on 60 square meters. We can be transparent about that. So we only pay about 350 to 450 euros, 450 euros warm, which is really good. But we had to do all of this work and invest an initial amount of money, which is why we need to expropriate them and rent caps don't work, right? We don't want to have people having to live in dumps like this, right? Um, so the uh, Deutsche Wohnen and Eignen, as an expropriate Deutsche Wohnen, um, was uh, conceived in 2017. The idea, it came out of the already existing local grassroots moving and Koti and Co. That's something that Michael, I think also had talked about before. Um, you, you said there was, you, you've mentioned a video or a documentary from 2014 talking about tenants. Mitra Vela. Mitra Vela. Mitra, 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 Mitra Vela. 2014 Kreuzberg. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the, this is just one more like Deutsche Wohnen and Eignen, which is important what is important to understand is it was only conceived in 2017 and it's just one more link in a very long chain that started sometime in the 1990s and early 2000s when properties were privatized in Berlin of tenants taking action. We have tenant unions in Berlin which have as much as like 150,000 members too. There is this local organization, Kotti and Co, that focuses on Cottbus at Tor, which is a very, very small area in, uh, in, Neuker, in Kreuzberg, actually in Kreuzberg, where traditionally the Turkish working class used to live, where rents are going up and everything. Um, and then they, they started, and they were also advertising for returning these properties into the state's hand in this area. And then they came up with the idea of like, why not all properties? Why not all properties that are, that are owned by landlords who own more than 3,000 properties, which is a surprising amount of landlords in Berlin, actually. Uh, Deutsche Wohnen is the biggest one of those. Uh, they're traded on the stock market uh, and they own about 110,000 properties <laughs> in Berlin alone. So they decide the price or of rents in the city. They and the cronies, the other um, organization, the other gigantic uh, real estate landlords in Berlin who, who all, own all of these flats and who can set 
uh, their rents and dominate the rental market. Which is why, um, and that's, that's I think, uh, which is why this process here on, on the right, I don't know if, if that works for you, if I point in the direction of it, um, it's in German and I will talk about it again. What I wanted to make clear here simply is we, um, it started in 2018, the actual campaign, and it is supposed to end on the 26th of September this year with a referendum asking people whether or not we're going to expropriate landlords with more than 3000 properties. So how is that going to happen? I call it the Peter Parker principle, <laughs> where the German, the article 50 of the German basic law says with property comes responsibility. So um, one, one of the core uh, ideas behind it is, it says expropriation is, log is logical. And if it is for the good of uh, society as a whole, is lawful that's it and the, the core sentence is because with property comes responsibility uh, exactly um and and that's also what the campaign says this is the core argument that says or this is the core argument of the campaign it says we can do this we have done this and we need to do it again because the renter situation in berlin is getting out of hand Section five of the Berlin Constitution, which is on referenda, which are Article 61 to 65, you really don't need to know this. I thought I'll just put the information there for anyone who wants to get into death, but you don't need to know that. It just has um, the this process of how to get um, a referendum on, on any given law um, outlined. So you start with a uh, official campaign. You don't even have to collect any signatures. Then the Senate, as in um, the government of Berlin, will respond um, in, in any way fashionable or they see fit. Back then, they responded with saying, your proposal would cost 38 billion euros. Um, it is nonsense, but proceed. Yeah, You collect need to collect 20,000 signatures over the span of six months. Then they will check whether or not your proposal is lawful then you need to collect more than 180,000 signatures again in the span of six months. And then once you have done that, the Senate will set a um, time, which is this, uh, this part here, right? I don't know oops, if you can, if I can somehow highlight that, we can maybe zoom in on it. Yeah, the Senate will set a, um, will set a, a date a referendum. So that's the, the legal um, recourse that citizens have in the federal state and city of Berlin. Berlin is on federal state, right? That's um, important to understand. Um, it, I think we talked about it in Sheffield, people sought out their, their own uh, way to, to do this properly. Uh, I, I think um, most cities and states and even, even countries have in some way um, a, a recourse for citizens to come to bring their own political issues to parliament. I mean, we've seen it a lot of petitions in the United Kingdom and um, other sorts of uh, things. This process can still be flawed and it was flawed um, after the initial period uh, when they selected 77,000 um, signatures, the city which uh, was governed by, is governed and was governed at the time by the Social Democratic Union who are very much in line with property owners and private landlords, they actually started um, pushing back the next step of the process and trying to like win time and hope the issue would go away. Uh, they didn't allow for the next step to start collecting signatures from June 2019 until February 2021. So that was a that that, that was polit that was political will. The city um, dragged out the process deliberately and hoped it would go away. Uh, luckily, it didn't. The activists actually started pushing and saying, "If you don't start with the next step, we will just do the next step because it is outlined in the law, and we will hand you the signatures, and then you will have to react." But uh, they they did get there in the end, uh, luckily. Then um, the economic vision, 
have to now we've, we've outlined uh, how it's supposed to work for the law how is it supposed to work economically financially specifically um there, there have been two numbers circulating by um the city government one is 28 billion euros which um, is an estimate uh, which relies on the current today's fixed market value of all these properties that need to be expropriated in Berlin. And their first, their exaggerated, um, uh, exaggerated uh, estimation, 36 billion euros, it's uh, based on the promise of future revenue through rising rents that these landlords would be expropriated, would be missing out on. So I think what's important, the takeaway lesson here is, do not rely on the government. Don't, if you want to expropriate landlords anywhere, do not ask the city to do it for you because the city, even though it is a left-wing government, the Social Democratic Union very much sides with the landlords. And what they were trying to do is to have these inflated shocking numbers of how much expropriation would cost so that people would shut up about the issue. I, that, that's, that's what I really think was their plan there is absolutely no reason to calculate based on promise of future revenue which would be lost by landlords um, other other than that there is a more um, appropriate um, estimate i i do have uh, which which is um, 8 to 18 billion euros which uh, comes from professors from the university of frankfurt and uh, humboldt university berlin who i think have cooperated with the movement and who have made a study saying that if, if the, um, the legal or not legal, if, if, if the company that would take up these flats would lower rents to three euros 40 per square meter, which would be really cheap, which would mean that we would pay somewhere around 200 euros a month, um, then the expropriation cost should be based on the future revenue that this organization would get so so the so what do people think is the appropriate price for rents that is what the estimate of how much money should be given to those who are being expropriated and reimbursement that's what it should be based on rather than the current market value which is already inflated for financialization and speculation or even anything like promised future revenue missed through rising rents or anything like that so i think um that's really uh that's, that's really important that uh, academics and universities kind of aligned themselves with um, the movement, helped them out and ended up um, pub publishing, publishing these, uh, publishing these um, uh, studies. Then um, there is also, and that's what I again find very interesting. I think that's a very DM thing. They have a, a very concrete idea uh, the movement has a very concrete idea of how the organization was supposed to manage these properties after they've been taken from private landlords, how it should look like. And I know, again, this is in German, but let me quickly explain. You have the entire city, which is this bottom, bottom line here. They vote, of course, for the parliament. Uh, and the parliament uh, doesn't, okay, for the parliament and the government, that's what they vote for. The government will have representatives in a board, which will be comprised of members of the government, representatives, this is this line, of the city, then all of the employees, all of the employees and all of the tenants from this, uh, from, from the um, public agency, which manages the, um, the, oops, which manages the properties, which will be comprised also with the, the, the people who will, the employees will also have their own uh, internal union. There will be representatives of um, each neighborhood of, uh, of a whole, whole different host of, of people. Let's not get into too much detail here. And, and they will end up, uh, they, they will end up electing the board again, which will elect the, the, the board of CEOs of this public um, company. So it's supposed to be democratic from the ground up, including people who aren't even directly involved with um, the company, but because the rents of the biggest, then biggest landlord in Berlin would of course affect all Berliners, they should also have a right um, in, 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 in saying 
have should have a saying in how, how how high rents should be or what's the minimum standards for renovations or uh, protection of tenants and so forth so it's supposed to be democratic and fully transparent collective and public ownership of uh, this entire structure of how to manage this um well, it's a public agency. It's called Anstalt Öffentlichen Rechts. It's one of those ugly German words that just don't seem to end. But um, it's it's supposed to mean um, a pub, an agency of public law, of public right. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe now the juicy stuff. I think what 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 uh, Rosemary has been waiting for mostly, um, which is uh, how how did the organization of the movement itself. Um, happen again. I um, I didn't. I wasn't involved with the with the top level organizing, but I can definitely tell you that from the ground level, it seemed uh, very effective in Prenzlauer Berg um, and Pankow Süd, where technically I'm from. But in Prenzlauer Berg, we had a very um, active Keats team, and a Keats is like a subdivision of a neighborhood in Berlin. So you would have um, I, I think similarly in, in you would have Whitechapel being a part of Tower Hamlets, Tower Hamlets, the neighborhood Whitechapel, right, the subdivision of that overall neighborhood. So similarly, not exactly the same, similarly in Berlin, you have subdivisions of neighborhoods, which are also much like much tighter or tightly knitted communities, not exactly like the villages in London, but perhaps um, yeah, perhaps like more on a on a on a cultural rather than necessarily historical level. Um, and each of these Keats had their own uh, neighborhood group, a Keats team. Uh, I was part of the Keats team, Prince Lauerberg. There was a Keats team, uh, Kreuzberg, Wedding, and so on and so forth. The uh, the power was like the core business of the entire movement. What we have seen in the structure earlier is to collect signatures up until this point, right? Collect signatures to drive the democratic process that could then eventually trigger a referendum if successful, and they have been successful in that. Um, so, so the core responsibility of collecting these signatures was in these devolved units in each neighborhood, just a bunch of, okay, in our telegram group, there's like 50 to 100 people in there, but they're not all active, but we would meet every Friday we would collect signatures regularly. We would try and do different kinds and sorts of actions. We would knock, go from door to door and talk to people face to face and try and um, take their fears. Many of them, of course, uh, having experienced the GDR would say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to have anything to do with expropriation and let the capitalists do what they want because I don't want to go back to the GDR. And, uh, course everyone we would try and be like this has nothing to do with east germany this is part of west german history and culture too um so uh, as proven of course in in uh, the constitution and everything so the core business of um of this very targeted uh, campaign was with the devolved so like with the with the devolved units of the campaign which i found really interesting i actually never watched a tv interview with any of uh, the representatives i generally don't really watch much german tv mostly watch netflix whatever youtube um and and so i, I i'm I'm completely unaware. I mean, I'm not unaware of this. I know that in the group chat, someone will share and say like, oh, look, they went on TV again and said something, but uh, that was almost irrelevant. It will become more, irre more relevant now, but like, again, the core business, collecting signatures, that was with um, the devolved powers. I do think that um, th what, I, what I also wanted to show you is, uh, they, they've created a very simple app. Um, I don't know if you can see that. It looks like this in the official branding. And all it does is uh, you can you can go on a map. It's really simple. And on that map, there used to be lots of pins everywhere. And uh, you could just go to your closest point to collect signatures. So there would be a pin. You would click on a pin. It would say Friday, 7 o'clock, this location collecting signatures, two hours. We need five people. 
and you can just do that. Anyone could do it. Anyone can download the app. Um, so very, very bottom bottoms up. And then, of course, what the app would also do is um, you could you could just uh, there would be Q and A's, uh, like um, the very basic stuff. When do we start collecting? How long do we need to collect signatures? Up until um, super intricate arguments about how much private landlords invest in uh, new properties and everything. So, but like very, very, very basic um, informative digital material worked perfectly fine. And of course, funding similarly to Diem, just small donations. The last, the last number I heard of was 60,000 euros that were collected before the beginning of collecting signatures which was, as we saw on the little thingy from the 26th of February until the 25th of 24th of June. Um, and then with those 60,000 60, euros, they did not go to waste. They got those um, purple, yellow vests, right? Highly visible, um, super present in the city, everything on brand as well. Um, high recognition, like uh, we, we started illegally. Um, I didn't put a picture of that and unfortunately postering um over the city on, on like house walls and uh on bridges and um, <clears throat> just just lampposts and everything and i think people in the city were just constantly exposed to this to this to this visual of the movement is present if you if you went out chances are you see someone with a vest if you go on a protest you see hundreds of people with vests but even just in, in your day-to-day -day life you will spot it constantly i of course have an eye for it and i see it everywhere i'm like there is a sticker there is a poster there is a person but like, even if you don't care you would recognize it and then once this rent cap i earlier mentioned was overturned it just clicked like everyone suddenly the movement was everywhere everyone wanted to sign they um exceeded the necessary amount of uh, of, of signatures by 100,000 or 120,000 in the end because everybody wanted to sign and everybody was aware of it. And again, on the one hand, you had a 60,000 euros that were collected and then really well spent by like more central organs, I suppose, of the, of the movement. Um, but then the distribution, again, like it wasn't, there was no central point where anyone went to pick, the, pick up the vests in each Keats and each subdivision of a neighborhood right there was a little shop maybe a bicycle shop or a little cafe that in the back would like store a little a little box that was filled to the brim with informational material and lists and everything and then in the app you could look at the drop-off points if you were collecting a lot of signatures uh, in your own building that you could just bring there and everything so everything highly devolved i never saw the face of anyone someone would consider important maybe i did i don't know but um i think it, so that really spoke to me right this horizontal structure um that i think is uh what was absolutely uh, important i did make a protest sign i had a you can see at the bottom here i had a um, i had a cable channel from my renovation left over and some paper <laughs> yeah uh that's that's that says no profits with rent it rhymes it says keine profite mit der miete and underneath it says erst das essen dann die miete which is an old communist slogan that the communists used on a rent strike in the 1930s early 1930s so it means first food then rent yes then let's just quickly okay that was the juicy part that that's probably one, what we will want to talk about a bit more in a, in a second. I just want to quickly flip through these, uh, flick through these uh, last things I, I, I really wanted to mention. Um, why not use this money to build new flats, even if it only costs only, it's still a big number, 8 billion euros. Why not just build new flats? We don't want to rely on the market anymore, right? We, do, I don't, we don't think that if the government builds a couple of buildings now, uh, or even a lot of buildings. And then the next government overturns this decision, like no more, no more of this. There should be a central organization. They, it will be self-financing. It won't even cost 8 billion euros. The rents will pay for the, for the credits that will be taken on. And then we will have a long-term uh, long organization that will 
work towards creating new flats, Bestandsschutz, it's a German word, again, funny German word, Bestandsschutz, uh, which means it will protect existing tenants. That's really important. It will like end evictions and, and it will end speculation in the city. Even if we build new buildings, right? The next government could just decide to sell them or uh, and then uh, it could sell them to the highest bidder. And again, it could go into the hands of a company that tries to, um, that tries to, uh, tries to make money by trading stocks on the market. So no more of this, we've had it, right? Um, then, oh, but expropriating landlords will disincentivize investment in new buildings. Private landlords in Berlin reinvest only 1.5% of the expenditures in construction. They're already existing and still very badly run. State-owned enterprises in Berlin that own about 80,000 properties reinvest 27%. We believe that our uh, our organization could go up as high as 40% because the state-owned enterprises are still run as private enterprises, having to overturn a profit. Um, and the CEO still makes 400,000 euros a year. No more of this, no more private market forces. We will build a organization that will serve the tenants in the city only. And expropriation happens all the time. And uh, I remember in this video, one of the guys said, like, uh, expropriation has never happened in Germany. Germany constantly uses Article 15 of the Constitution to expropriate entire villages to uh, get coal out of the ground. So, yeah, so, so much to, to, to that argument, yeah. Um, and then very quickly, that's the intersectionality thing I've mentioned earlier in the beginning. Uh, I hope I'm not boring you. I think uh, refugees arriving in the city shouldn't be held in uh, central centers or anything if there is such a thing as a centrally, uh, as, as a central big uh, organization, uh, they can have contingency flats where refugees arriving in the city could, could be uh, brought to rather than some sort of central detention center. The same goes for other marginalized communities who are being discriminated at the, on the rental market. Um, this is a statistic from the United Kingdom that black people are almost uh, five times as likely as white people to face discrimination when looking for a home. The same, of course, this is universally true, of course. Uh, the same is true in Germany. If, if you have a Turkish second name, you're like 50% less likely to hear back from a landlord. So all of this kind of stuff uh, that, that need, would, would end with an organization or, or with, with expropriating the landlords. We're not relying on private markets anymore and on transparent processes. Um, survivors of domestic abuse often have to return to the perpetrator. Um, this is a very, a very important um, part of the campaign as well. This is a note um, that was published in 2016 uh, in a newspaper article of a woman from a Berlin woman shelter hotline. And it just speaks for itself. It's very sad. Uh, not sufficient space, client has separate children, woman will return to pay perpetrators flat. Uh, we want a organization that will hold contingencies that will keep flats for cases like this. So um, people don't have to go back to um, the horrendous, horrendous conditions uh, many of us live in. Uh, preschools and kindergartens are being evicted in, in Berlin as well by private landlords. Their um, contracts being cancelled. Um, artists, the culture scene, the entire identities of neighborhoods are could be eradicated on the whim, on a whim of a private capitalist investor. Most notably, that happened recently. To uh, that was also mentioned in one of the articles that uh, John and Michael shared, the Bloomberg article, the, Synd the Syndicate. Um, a bar in Schillerkeets does not exist anymore. They were already forced out. There was war-like uh, scenes in the streets. There were protests. The police came in full riot gear. 5,000 policemen against a few hundred protesters um, was absolutely brutal. Also, no more of this. Artists and cultures we don't even have to talk about in times of Corona. Many of them can't afford their rents. Many of them are going bust. Berlin is known as a culture, as a, as a city of subcultures and uh, alternative scenes, and uh, we cannot afford afford to lose this kind of cultural and intellectual diversity. Small businesses as well, 
And of course, the climate disaster, really important. Um, there are laws on landlords having to upgrade their flats. Interestingly, landlords in Germany aren't allowed to kick out any tenants unless they, they claim Eigenbedarf, which means as much as they for own use. So they go to the lawmakers or like to, to, to courts and say, we need this flat for a valid reason. And the valid reason usually is we need to renovate it. And then the next reason is because we need to, under the new regulations by the government, we need to uh, increase the energy efficiency of this building. So all the tenants have to leave. Then they do the minimum max, the minimum required for energy efficiency, but turn the flats into luxury flats so that the old tenants can't return. It is a common trick to evict uh, uh, people in Berlin, and uh, that's not going to happen anymore. It's not. We, we don't want companies only doing the minimum uh, to avoid the climate catastrophe that these days we are experiencing in Berlin. Right, 45 people died last night and this morning. In, in Western Germany. And uh, we don't want uh, protecting the environment and our future uh, being used as a, yeah, as an excuse, as a smokescreen to evict people and make even more money off of their lives. And evictions in general, uh, Michael will have heard of Riga Straße, which is a street in Friedrichshain, Kreuzberg, one of the most popular neighborhoods in Berlin but it is a street full of um, cultural and political diversity and identity where anarcho-feminist, um, self-sufficient groups are occupying uh, old houses that were left abandoned after the fall of the Berlin Wall and are now being forcefully evicted again by thousands of policemen at the time and humiliating. And um, that's also not supposed to happen anymore. There is one of those scenes that happened. Uh, I also went to one of those protests. I had my own pictures, but they weren't quite as nice. But uh, the police in Germany is no joke. The Social Democratic Union in Berlin, uh, the Social Democratic Party in Berlin, is currently running uh, for to, to, to become the mayor of the city again. And their core point of the political agenda is more security. Forget it. <laughs> okay. Uh, then, lastly, the backlash. Um, John asked about that once. It's uh, these are the donations from real estate, from the real estate lobby, from private landlords that each party or each of the major parties has received since the year two, 2000 in million euros. And the Christian Democratic Union, of course, the German equivalent of the Tories, Angela Merkel's party, received 5.4 million euros since the year 2000, far eclipsing any other of the German uh, political parties. And the most interesting fact about this is, this is about a time span of 21 years, but the majority of that money, okay, the biggest share of that money, the 1.45 million, four or five million euros, 1.4 to 5 million euros, the Christian Democratic Union received over the last year and a half, since the beginning of 2020, which shows that landlords are scared and they should be because we're coming for them. Okay, so of course they're putting the money where the mouth is, they're donating as much as they can to the most uh, right-wing acceptable party they can think of. They're also surprisingly um, donating a lot of money to the AFD. And AFD hasn't been around for the last 20 years, but they are already catching up with the Social Democratic Party, even though they've been an established party only for the last five years. So also very interesting where landlords are putting their money. But that's enough of that. Um, there is an old German slogan that says, Wer hat uns verraten? Sozialdemokraten, which is, uh, means who has betrayed us, the Social Democrats. The, the Blairites. Uh, it's it's a it's a slogan that's as old as Rosa Luxemburg, I think. So, uh, the Greens are undecided uh, on 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 the conflict uh, and conflicted. They have like local politicians in some neighborhoods who are support the movement. Some who are strictly against it on the federal level, in particular. The Linke is of course for the movement in the Christian Democratic Union. Uh, after you've just seen the statistics, is of course against it. There has been a huge backlash on social media, thousands of trolls. I haven't seen anything like this since Brexit. <laughs> flooding the site of left-wing politicians and uh, the organization, uh, shit posting and trolling everyone who dares to open their mouth even a little bit. The Christian Democrats just lie. They just lie. They just say, 
oh, um, you are a private property owner. Of course, he has a like, happy little family in front of their private family home. And they're like, if you want to keep your own house, we will protect you from the evil communists. That's, I mean, pretty much what it says here. It says, um, uh, uh, preserve your dream of your own uh, home uh, for your own I don't know, bliss or like like living bliss. Um, do not uh, like keep your fingers uh, or like thou shall keep the fingers of uh, the property of others. And the Christian Democrats are of course for the basic right, almost the civic right that weren't like basic right of private property. So uh, that's completely made up. No one wants to expropriate single family homes, of course, it just just lies more lies and and this is even worse this is he says uh, Deutsche Wohnen and Eigen wants to expropriate um living cooperatives which is just completely made up that is not true uh we support cooperatives obviously um this is just how far they'll go uh this is the last thing I want to leave you with though uh this is a election um, poster by the Christian Democratic Union. I think it's from like the 1940s, 19, early 1950s. And uh, Gemeinwirtschaft means common economy. And um, it's been circulated a lot, of course, within the campaign that don't, don't tell the modern liberals and Christian Democrats, but before neoliberalism, under Keynesianism, they were for it, right? They wrote those laws into our, they were the ones who wrote those laws into our constitution. It wasn't some crazy Marxist uh, lefty who, who, who smoked too much wheat or however they would like to imagine us today. It was, it was them who wrote those laws and uh, we're gonna use them against them. All right. Thank you, Felix. Uh, can we um, can we get back onto our? There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh